Hi there. Uh, now you guys probably agree with this statement that we're facing some pretty big problems in the world today. And the way we've been tackling them so far uh, is struggling to keep up. And we all ask, can technology help? Now we're looking at that here from a number of different angles. Uh, but I'm going to try to take a perspective that you might not otherwise have. Uh, Edmund Schlossberg said, the skill of writing is to create a context in which other people can think. Uh, I'm going to try to give you a perspective on the trends, the extraordinary convergence of computing and human potential that's taking us towards what you might actually call a global brain. Now let me start in a, perhaps an area that seems very close to what you're talking about here, but has some unseen dimensions, and that's the Google Autonomous Vehicle, the self-driving car. You know, what I want to draw your attention to is uh, the fact that when the DARPA Grand Challenge was held in 2005, this is one of the vehicles that competed, the victor went seven miles in seven hours. Uh, 2011, Google announced that they had driven hundreds of thousands of miles in ordinary traffic. What happened in those uh, six years? Um, First, you know, we obviously see that there's been advances in artificial intelligence, uh, you know, Jeopardy, uh, you know, Watson beating the, the best uh, human players, uh, big step forward. But it isn't just better AI. Peter Norvig, Google's chief scientist, said, we don't have better algorithms. We just have more data. And that brings me to a key element of what's going on right now. And it was foreseen uh, by Vannevar Bush uh, in 1945 in his article, uh, As We May Think. We talked about the, p the power of this future uh, devices to, bring, to augment our intelligence. And he said, we, we can't hope to equal the speed and flexibility with which the mind follows an associative trail, but it should be possible to beat the mind decisively in regard to the permanence and clarity of the items retrieved from storage. And of course, we see that Google is Vannevar Bush's uh, Memex, as he called it, this machine that would be this information retrieval. I, I, I search for as we may think. You see it's the first link. Uh, we actually pull up the article from 1945, and bingo, we're done. Uh, we see this in our phone. You know, this is a device that knows where we are. It uh, is a knowing assistant telling us where to go, how to get there. It's this information retrieval device. Okay. Uh, beyond information retrieval device, our phones uh, connect us with other people. So uh, coming back to the, the car, OK, it's this AI, but it's also information retrieval. And what's the real secret of this machine is that the more data that P Peter referred to is the memory of Google Street View car drivers uh, who are augmented with all kinds of sensors. You know, there's a little spinning uh, laser rangefinder on the top of the car measuring exactly where the car is. Right? So the AI just has to make last minute decisions. One of the things Peter said to me, he said, you know, it's kind of a hard AI problem to pick out uh, a traffic light out of the field of view of a camera. It's a very easy AI problem to figure out if the traffic light is red or green if you already know that it's there. And it's really interesting because what we're really seeing here is an example of the third great trend in making our computers smarter, which is human-computer symbiosis. And this was also foreseen early on. In 1960, JCR Licklider, who was the DARPA program manager who actually funded uh, TCPIP and really gave us the internet, wrote that he hoped that in not too many years, human brains and computing machines would be coupled together very tightly, and that the resulting partnership will think as no human brain has ever thought and process data in a way not approached by the information handling machines we know today. And that's what you're seeing in that Google, electronic, that Google autonomous vehicle. It's human brains coupled with computers, coupled with AI, through the mechanism of stored data. The, the, the car is remembering what the people did. And this is yet another example of what I've been calling since I sort of started promulgating the term Web 2.0 as an example of harnessing collective intelligence. Now, we are building a network-mediated global mind. It's not Skynet, though. It's us, augmented by computers. And there's this great definition of uh, collective intelligence and global consciousness uh, uh, 
by Danny Hillis, where he said, global consciousness is that thing responsible for deciding that pots containing decaffeinated coffee should be orange. You know, how did that Sanka brand color spread to become a relatively universal symbol? It's the transmission of knowledge from mind to mind. And this is what you see accelerated, for example, in Twitter, where a new meme like OWS, Occupy Wall Street, can spread uh, across the world uh, and become a, a, a known and a way of, of linking up concepts and people. And we also see this in more humbly in things like Wikipedia. This is uh, the first Wikipedia page for the great Japanese earthquake uh, last year. Uh, it ended up like this. And you can watch that happen uh, over a period of a few uh, weeks and, and months it's continued to be updated slightly as thousands of people make uh, many, many thousands of edits coming together through the medium of technology uh, to create a product that uh, could not have uh, been created uh, any other way. Uh, in his wonderful book about network science reinventing discovery, Michael Nielsen uh, makes this fabulous statement about Wikipedia. He says, it's not an encyclopedia. It's a virtual city whose main export to the world is its encyclopedia, but with an internal life of its own. So here's technology used to bring human intelligence together in a new way. And you can actually see every Wikipedia page has a talk tab if you haven't noticed that. And this, that's where people discuss the contentious issues. Michael goes into a whole lot of ways that we can use collective intelligence, examples of it for solving scientific problems, and so on. But uh, uh, this is just a small and humble example. But kind of talking about cities brings me to this next important topic. This is a visualization that appeared in Wired magazine of uh, 24 hours of New York City 311 calls. Now, you can see all the topics that came up and what time of day they came up. Uh, this is fabulous. But I want to suggest that the notion of visualization is a halfway house. You know, that Google car isn't visualizing what to do for the driver. It's just doing it. And that's this sort of notion of real time that is coming into the, to this uh, uh, this new world. Uh, Jeff Jonas of IBM said, would you be willing to cross the street with information that was five minutes old? It's a fabulous IBM commercial. It's probably available on YouTube. And no, you would not. Right? So we're moving towards a real-time world. Now, we're seeing how that, that's played out in areas like advertising, uh, where Google solved what you could call the Wanamaker problem. John Wanamaker, the, the father of modern advertising, said, half the money I spend on advertising is wasted. The trouble is, I don't know which half. And you know, Google solved that with pay-per-click rather than paper impression. Uh, but we're trying, to start, we're trying to solve it beyond advertising now you know, with this real-time feedback loop notion, you know, where uh, Pascal Witz of GE Medical Diagnostics pointed out how healthcare is changing, where we're starting to shift from the notion that you do diagnosis and then you do treatment to that you're doing a constant cycle of diagnosis and treatment until we figure out what works. And we see the same sort of aspect of real time that we see in the Google vehicle, that we see in Google advertising, that we see in uh, now in medical diagnostics, now in uh, managing our traffic, in managing uh, our, our vehicles. So here, San Francisco SF Park uh, has connected parking meters that tell you where the parking is, where it's available. You're starting to see this feedback loop between humans uh, and uh, computers in real time so that the car, uh, the driver, uh, can find out where to park, less traffic, less, uh, less waste. Uh, a recent article in the Times uh, about uh, this increasingly sense of mission control for cities, uh, visualization of what's going on in real time, management in real time, this network consciousness of connecting people, sensors, computers, uh, is uh, really entering the mainstream. But it's also coming not in a, just in a centralized way, but in a decentralized way from the market. When you look at something like Uber, uh, which allows you to, to summon a private vehicle from your cell phone, or city car share, or um, relay rides, uh, these are examples of the computer being used to coordinate humans in a new way that's more efficient. Uh, Airbnb, you know, letting us share our, uh, you know, creating a virtual hotel out of, of, of millions of homes. Now, this is what Lisa Gansky calls the mesh, the sharing economy. And this is being enabled by uh, a new kind of computing model. Uh, there are people like uh, Amy, Gavin Starks, I know, is, is talking here, 
uh, about how do you build the back end for this in the energy economy. Um, you know, people at the UN are looking at how we build a network of sensors to monitor the world uh, uh, for good. The, the, the technology that's behind this has increasingly come to be called data science. And it's kind of interesting, this graph from LinkedIn shows uh, the demand for uh, uh, the set of skills that are collectively called uh, data science. You can just see it going vertical. How do you actually take all this data, work it into something meaningful? And so in all of your work, you have to start thinking about how big data collected from sensors involving humans is going to turn into feedback loops that will drive uh, your products. So I want to return to this notion that this is all leading towards a global brain, you know, that this global brain is us connected and augmented. And I want to do this with a sort of unexpected picture. This is a 1945 picture from Life magazine. The world was electrified by Vannevar Bush's article in The Atlantic. And Life magazine imagined what his Memex would look like. And you can kind of see it's got relays. It brought it was microfilm. And uh, you know, well, it looks like kind of like, like iPads on the top of the t desk, don't they? Um, but clearly, uh, that doesn't look anything at all like Google. And uh, my point is that the global brain is still a child. That's my grandson. Uh, I've been spending a lot of time with him thinking about how this technology is still in its infancy. And something that uh, I once was told when my kids were little. Uh, stuck with me. He said, your job as a parent is to prepare your child for the future. If this global brain is still a child, what should we be teaching it and how should we be rearing it? That's a really key question for us all to answer. It's not just a technical question. It's not just a business question. It's a moral question. You know, predictive analytics and information a applications, that data science, it mirrors human learning. The algorithms and the goals we set for them mirror our virtues and vices. And you know, when we use collective intelligence uh, for good, as uh, when social media was used to try to in increase the, the democracy in the Middle East, uh, that's a good thing. When uh, companies have big goals like access to all the world's information, or how can applications be better when they're social, or even you know, my own company's goal, changing the world by spreading the knowledge of innovators, these are examples of trying to do something good to create a better world with this technology. But we also see examples of data science used for private gain and public harm. We saw this in the 2008 financial collapse uh, driven by speculation. This article in Foreign Policy really caught my eye, how Goldman Sachs created the food crisis by you know, manipulating um, um, futures for, uh, for, for food. This is, is sort of using this technology for evil. And we have to figure out how to use it for good. So my question uh, for you, and to make sure you put this into your thinking, and I know because of who you are in this group, um, it, this is on your mind, we have to ask, how are we going to make this emerging global consciousness not just more resilient, not just more able to help us uh, build a new kind of economy, a new kind of energy uh, system, uh, a new kind of culture, but also, uh, how will we make it more moral? Because We've only got one world. You guys know this. And we've got to get it right. Thank you very much.